Welcome to the No Plateau Podcast. For stroke and brain injury survivors, their caregivers, and the therapists helping them to break boundaries in their recovery journey. Hosted by Henry Hoffman, a certified occupational and clinical therapist, and Pete Duran, a certified podcast host. CPH, look it up. This podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the No Plateau podcast. I am your host, Henry Hoffman. We have a very special guest with us today. Not only uh, did he suffer a stroke not too long ago, but he launched an awesome website full of excellent resources on recovery and his journey. It's called the Stroke Angel Project, and he's going to share some of his stories and tips with us. Without further ado, I want to welcome Skip Batchelder. Say that name three times super fast. And before we start, Skip, I did learn that you just had your 50th year wedding anniversary. Is that correct? That is correct. You got to share with the audience. I know we briefly talked about this pre-show. What is that magic bullet for getting through 50 years with your lovely uh, spouse? I've always told everybody that you got two things have to happen. One, you have to work at it every day, never give up. And number two, you have to become best friends. Absolutely. And that's key. I mean, it's hard to ha- live with someone for 50 years if you're kind of always annoyed with your spouse, right? That's not going to not going to go well. I'm not saying we didn't have our ups and downs, Yeah, but it's been a wonderful 50 years. Great. She was the team captain of my recovery. Yeah. Well, you need that. You need that. And I know we're going to get into that in a second, but I guess let's start off like we do with many of our podcasts. Uh, If you can just give the audience a brief background of who you are, where you came from, a little bit more information, that'd be great. So I am uh, 73 years young, born here in California. I live in California at this particular time, after a short 14-year period, right after college that we lived in New Jersey. College graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Marketing. We have a son. He's 45 years old. He is a licensed clinical social worker. He specializes in returning veterans. We're very proud of him. So I had a corporate career with a life insurance company in New Jersey. Then I was a consultant for 20 years. Then I worked part-time for Home Depot for the last 20 years. So I've had a very full life uh, employment. I'm an author, graphic artist. I'm a webmaster and a blogger. I'm the founder of the Stroke Angel Project. That's it? That's all you do? Come on. (laughs) That's a lot of stuff there. I do that with a lot of naps. Yes, of course. Well, that's that's the key. That's the other key to success for a long marriage, isn't it? A lot of naps in between, right? Obviously, you're on this podcast because you suffered a stroke and you have a really cool project going uh, that we'll get into. But let's actually talk about what was life like literally a week before your stroke? What was, I know you got into what you, what you did and your son and, and your marriage, but literally what was life like Monday through Friday, the week before the stroke? Chaos, hectic, out of control. I was trying to do way too much and my body really wasn't ready for that. I was 45 pounds overweight. My diet was terrible. My salt intake was just a disaster. The average uh, sodium intake should be about 1,850 milligrams. Mine was approaching 10,000 milligrams a day. Wow. Tell me you were working at a Asian restaurant. I mean, why would you have that much sodium? Because I picked a lot of foods, particularly processed foods. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would go to bed with a bag of chips after eating, you know, eight tacos. It was a mess. Let me ask you one other question about that. Did you, how long have you, were you living like that? Too long. I mean, we're talking decades. Yeah, certainly. And did you have early warning signs that, Hey, did the doctor say to you, look, Skip, you got to cut this out. This is like out of control. I mean, how was your cholesterol? Cholesterol was, was manageable. And I was under doctor's care for hypertension. That was in the middle of the, the pandemic. I hadn't seen my doctor in three years. I was taking a a blood pressure medicine dosage that was four, four or five years old. So it wasn't up to date. Plus I had all these really bad influences on my, on my health. And when one day it all caught up to me. The day of the stroke. Some people have it while they're sleeping. Some people have it when they get out of bed. Some people have it at work. What's your story with the day of the stroke? What happened? So it was a pretty normal day. It was a Friday uh, in uh, June of 2021. I had come home early to meet with the window consultant from Home Depot for some windows that we we're going to have put into the house. And he and I were sitting around my kitchen table and um, we're talking about the project and I'm making notes. And 
all of a sudden my I couldn't control my hand and it just kept rolling off of my effort. And I looked up and I said, I'm in trouble. And I collapsed. Wow, that quick. And, and literally, you knew you're in trouble because the hand was weak for a couple of seconds or was there something else going on? I was just losing. I couldn't even sit up. So Sam, my window consultant, he jumped up. He put his hand on my chest. He held me against the chair. He's got my cell phone and his cell phone. I can see it out of the corner of my eye. And he's got 911 on one cell phone. He's got my wife on the other cell phone. And so he's he's doing all of his business right there. As a result of his reaction and his reaction time, the EMTs were in my kitchen in 10 minutes, and I was in the ER at Kaiser in 25 minutes. Wow. Well, let's just pause for one second, because we'll get to how you're doing later. But that's a major note right there, that you got someone to your house in 10 minutes, and you got to Kaiser in how many minutes? 25. Okay. Uh, in Kaiser ER, completely surrounded by the the emergency team in 25 minutes. That is unbelievable. And so we'll we'll get to how important that is later. So, wow, what an angel to work with you, be there for you at that point, had two phones going. I mean, that guy's like, I'm assuming he's in your will now, right? <laughs> well, is that my <laughs> will yet? But I'm very proud of Sam for two reasons. One, he really was the angel there t- that day. And the Stroke Angel Project is named for him. Really? And he has since been given the Angel Award by Home Depot for life saving, and it's a very rare award. So Home Depot had this award prior to your stroke, and wow, that's interesting. And is he still at Home Depot? Oh yeah. Okay. And you talk to him all the time. Yep. That's amazing. So you shared with me if you're going to have a 50 year marriage that when you get that center 50 yard line seat to the San Francisco 49ers game, it better be your wife. In this case, it probably could be Sam, right? Yeah, Sam might be Sam on this side. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right, so you get to the ER mm-hmm. within 25 minutes. What, at this point, are you conscious? I mean, what's going through your mind, number one? Number two, how long were you in the ER and, and what happened there? My consciousness was that I knew I was going to the ER. I, I, I was conscious in the ambulance. But we all know what the typical ER setting is, right? Yeah. Room coughing and hacking people. And I thought that's what I was headed for. But as soon as that ambulance pulled up to the, uh, to the loading dock there, they rolled that gurney in, they, they got me transferred and immediately took me into the center of the ER. And I was completely surrounded by an emergency team. I had a, a physician right here. I had a neurosurgeon consultant on a video at the end of my gurney, they were talking back and forth and I was talking to them and I had other doctors and nurses around me. I mean, it was amazing. Just like that. How long were you in the ER? So I got into the ER towards the end of the afternoon. I went through all of the tests, uh, the CAT scan, the MRI. My symptoms kept shifting. For a while, they thought perhaps I had a mini stroke. And so they eventually worked that out of the the equation. And I was in a a room, a bed room in ER overnight. And that was primarily because there was no bed ready for me in the main hospital. But they transferred me the, the first thing in the morning. But something very unique happened that night that I need to note. I was visited by a gentleman in a white coat. And I do not know whether he was a tech or, or he was a physician. And he painted a very, very bad picture of my future. And I was so terribly depressed. I did not sleep at all that night. So the next morning, I was visited by a lady doctor. And she asked me the obligatory, how you doing? And I told her I'm not doing very well. And I'm I'm very despondent. And I told her what he said. And she said, well, that's all nonsense. Right. Let me tell you what it's really going to be like, and what your potential is. And from that moment on, I was heading to the races. So at that point in the ER, what was your movement like? Did you have full arm and hand function at that point? How was your leg? My leg was gone. It was completely immobile. Since learned to say it's not paralyzed because it wasn't paralyzed. It was immobile because right. I was getting the messages from here. My arm, I couldn't touch my nose. I kept doing this. Okay. So your coordination was off, but you had the you could open and close your hand and bend and straighten your elbow? I could. Okay. I could. But your leg, you couldn't really lift up your leg. I couldn't or, or wiggle your toes at that point. And and for the audience, this is just as a reminder, 
we're going through stages of stroke, right? And so that first stage, the first, let's say it's seven to 10 hours, they're just trying to keep you alive and they're trying to give you, stabilize you so you can actually live. And then you're going to transition to this acute stage. Now you're going through cortical shock. So Skip's brain where the infarct was, the, the cells surrounding that lesion, they're dead. They're not coming back. And so what we're trying to do is utilize, they call it perilesional, which is the area surrounding the core that died. And, and activate those neurons, but they're going through shock right now, right? They're, they're ill, they're barely alive, and it's going to take many weeks to reactivate them and get them going. And that's a process. And we'll find out at the end of this story what happened to his leg, uh, but it sounds like in the coordination, but it sounds like at this point, he's not doing that bad, which, which is good news, which means he has an arm that works and a hand that works. I know 90% of stroke survivors love to hear that option, but his leg is not working. And so, so again, we're day one post-stroke. So we're going to hear this. We're going to carry this journey out in a second, but I do have one question. I only bring it up because I just went through an MRI myself for my back and I didn't realize how claustrophobic I was until I did a, it's called an open MRI, which is not an open MRI. It was actually a close. They tricked me. Um, yeah, I can see my feet if I extend my you know neck just enough. And it was terrifying for me. So out of curiosity, when you had your brain scan, the MRI, did they put you in an actual big tube or did you have a specific one just for the head? Just for the head. Okay. And how long did it take? Do you remember how long it took? Because again, they're still trying to stabilize you. They don't want you to have another stroke while getting an MRI done. So how long did it take? 20 minutes. Okay. 20 minutes and two tries. Oh, really? Because I freaked on the first one. If you've never had one, it's just... Yeah. Describe it real quick for the audience. What is it like? Well, they move your head into this machine and you have to stay there and then it closes. And so now you're in this thing. It's like, like a science fiction movie. Is it almost like a helmet? Almost. And there's this pounding noise that's going on while it's doing its thing. And you have to stay as still as possible because it's taking pictures of your brain. Yeah, I never want to go through that again. And if you freak out two thirds of the way, they got to start over, right? So I was at the point after like... 17 minutes in, I had 30 minutes total. I'm like, how much longer? Because yeah, I had an itch. I had an itch. God forbid you itch. I never had such a concentration of will in my life. <laughs> well, especially since you just had a stroke. It's like the last thing you are in a condition to do is sit still and follow orders, you right. know, hours after a stroke event. It's just crazy. But it's it's what we got. All right. So you last in the ER for what, 24 hours? And then you transition to acute hospital. Is that, is that right? I would say it's more like 12 hours. All right. So you get over to the acute hospital. No, no, no. I'm just in the hospital. This is before my acute session. So I spent the next week in the hospital. And as you said, their role was number one, to keep me alive, to get me stabilized. And they worked very hard at that. And the other was to introduce me to therapies. Right. So, yeah. Some people call that the acute, like in rehab, we would call that acute inpatient as a therapist where I'm going to work with you for three, four days post event, post stroke. So did you have an occupational physical therapist and a speech therapist come to you at that point? So I had occupational and physical therapy. Okay. I, I had a lot of cognitive capabilities. There was no effect of my voice. Should I ask your wife that and confirm if that was the case before the stroke as well? Yeah, really. <laughs> so I worked that in Roseville, Kaiser Roseville. I had to work that week to prove that I could go on to the acute rehab center in Vallejo, California, which is about an hour and a half away. Right. Also I mean, inpatient rehab. So people yeah. don't get confused. Do you, yeah. you, are, you are a hospital patient and you are transferred to a rehab center within right. the hospital, very uh, high tech. But in that first week, I was doing things like learning to button my shirt again. Yeah. We're, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of tries, repetition mm -hmm. to do that. So by the end of the week, I could do my button. I could touch my nose. I couldn't do it with my eyes closed, but I could finally touch my nose. And they saw all these as potentials for the big show, which is in their rehab center, KFRC, they call it. So Skip, let me pause there. I mean, what you just described is a dream come true for a majority of stroke survivors, your first week presentation. Most of the time, patients do not have hand or arm function, especially their first seven days. So the therapist will not be training them to incorporate their affected hand to do 
uh, buttoning and putting the shirt on. Unfortunately, what they're doing is teaching them how to independently put their shirt on with their healthy side. It sounds like since you had movement, you didn't even have to do that. They, they pretty much said, use both arms and put your shirt on or put your pants on or, you know, gr brush your teeth and, and comb your hair and get ready. It was just engage your affected limb right then, right? They, they leave it up to you. That's why I've, I've said in all of my work that you really have to be the quarterback of your recovery. Nobody's going to do it for you. They can show you how to do it. They can tell you how to do it, but they can't do it. For you. Right. So I'm going to be doing a, a, another series on the first 90 days post-stroke down the road, but a preview will be talking about the things we're doing right as clinicians and the things we're doing wrong. And one of the things that a lot of us are doing wrong, and it's not so much for folks that have pretty good movement, such as yourself, the first seven days, it's more for the ones that don't. And one of the things we're doing wrong is we're overemphasizing what's called learn on use. And, and what happens is we encourage you and others that have limited ability on their stroke side, we encourage them to use their good side to get independent quickly while they're in the hospital. A, because insurance is going to run out. B, we got to show really good independent results. Those are two awful reasons to be doing that. But that's how we were trained as clinicians. The focus is FIM scores, get them independent, show them they're independent. Hospitals need to make money, get them out. That's a problem. The The real focus should be on if there was no barriers, would be, okay, Skip, what we're going to do, I know you can't use your affected limb to get your shirt on. We're going to work on your affected limb. We're going to train it. We're going to force you to engage that limb through various strategies. I won't get into all those strategies today, but there's a lot of interventions that are deemed beneficial to improve arm and hand function. And that's going to be 90% of our time together as a therapist. I'll spend the last 10% showing you some videos on YouTube, giving you some quick tips so you can still get your shirt on, still get your pants on, do some basic grooming. I'm going to show your family that too, so they can work with you on that in your room. Because you're going to be in your room a lot, okay? You're not going to be with me a lot. And so there's things you can do in your room. So one of the areas that uh, I like to emphasize with individuals that suffer a stroke when they have hours and hours to kind of hang out in their room by themselves or their family, they call them priming techniques. And, and there's a lot of things you can do to help promote neuroplasticity, ranging from mirror box therapy to, and, and we've, we've discussed these in, in previous podcasts, to mental practice, where you imagine moving when you can't move, kind of like athletes and performers, to something called action observation therapy, where... If you literally skip, this is a lazy person's dream come true. If you watch someone else exercise their butt off, you also rewire your brain by watching them. Isn't that crazy? So it's called action observation therapy. And it makes sense. Think about how many times we went to YouTube to watch someone swing a club or or try to do some performance or, or play the piano. We watch. And as we as we observe, our brains rewire and our brains uh, to, to do that task. So if Skip, if you were in the OT uh, gym and, and across from you is another patient working on functional task practice exercises with their arm and their hand, you observing them, it's not only rewiring their brain because they're doing the task, it's also rewiring your brain as if you were doing the task. It's super, super powerful. And that makes sense when you think about what we do to observe on any task. So these are things you can do in your room while you're sitting there waiting for your therapist. So I'm sorry for digressing, but as we transition from in uh, emergency room to acute, and most of the people don't look like you. A lot of the people have a limited arm and hand movement. You didn't. You you just had some coordination issues, which was great. And I do wonder if a lot of that has to do with the fact that you got to the hospital within 25 minutes, the ER. So before we get into the inpatient rehab facility, which you mentioned, you got to qualify for that. That's that's the ultimate show because you got to be able to do intense three hours. What was your feedback based on your experience in that acute, you know, three, four, five, seven days? before you went to inpatient rehab did it, did you did it work out for you was there anything that you wish they did that they didn't do any tips or strategies you'd recommend to others during that time frame uh, i guess my number one thing is you've really got to get a control of your emotions you've got to start dealing with what you've lost and how you're going to get it back if you're going to get it back because that's going to affect everybody that's around you it's going to affect your nurses it's going to affect your doctors it's going to affect your therapists you you have to get that attitude as positive as, po as you can, as early as you can, because you have a lot of work to do. Yeah, there's times when you're sitting around in the bed. I was able to rationalize the fact that this is my time to really start working. Right. Uh, I mean, my whole thing was to go back to work 
at the depot. They were telling me that that could happen as soon as three months, it took 12 months. But I mean, that was the hope that I was working with. And I wanted to perform. I wanted to show them that I was going to be able to do the work, not only there that first week, but after I got to uh, acute. Another thing that people don't think about is prior to your stroke, and by the way, what is your wife's name? Roberta. Prior to your stroke, Roberta, and you, 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 you weren't experts in stroke rehab. That was the last thing you probably knew about, right? Just like when you get a cancer diagnosis, the last thing you know is about that cancer typically, and then you got to start doing your research. So I'm assuming when you were in the hospital bed, there's probably a lot, whether it's your son or Roberta, Someone was Googling, you know, hey, what 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 happened? What's the outlook? You know, what resources do I need? What was that journey like for your family that first week? Frustrating because you you can Google till the cows come home, but finding what you need and how you can collect that information so that you can actually perform the duties that you need, both personally and within your team, that doesn't come that easily. How did you guys find that information that you needed? Was there uh, someone that helped you along the way or what? What was that like? There were attempts by the hospital to supply some of the basics, but something like nutrition, for example, you know, they would tell you your 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 tray doesn't have any salt on it. And that was the end of the lesson. <laughs> you know, it they didn't talk about, well, what had salt done to get you to this particular point in your life. So nutrition and dealing with emotions, those are the two things we're missing in the hospital. And I've discussed that with the hospital uh, at length. Good. Feedback's key, right? That's how you improve. So you then get transferred over to the big show that you call it. So inpatient rehab facility. How long were you at the inpatient rehab facility? Exactly two weeks. Okay. And that seems to be pretty average. I, I know some seven days, some 10 days, so two weeks. When I was working back in the day, it was more like three months. It's amazing how time has changed. I would say that two weeks was average. There were a number of people that were out of there in a week. There were also a number of people that were in really bad shape that were there longer. Yeah. How was inpatient rehab different than when you were at the acute hospital for those first few days? What's the difference between the two? If I use the term boot camp, you would know that it's a totally different experience. It's seven days a week, almost all day during the daytime. You have one therapy or another. So you're doing PT, you're doing OT, um, you're doing speech therapy, doing recreational therapy. And it's just like that. And you have brief periods of, uh, of rest. You have your meals. But the rest of the time during the day, you're, you're in a class. You're, you're being worked on. Did you have a sense that the therapist that you were working with really took charge and, and was up to date on the latest for your condition? And you didn't feel like you were wasting time? You know, you were always challenged. Would you describe it as that? Or did you have a different experience? Well, I was always challenged. Uh, and I had great, I had great faith in their their professionalism. The only two things that disappointed me was getting the right kind of information for how I was going to replicate what we were doing, but in my home setting. Right. And again, that nutrition thing, it, it just there was no mechanism for that. You know, you bring up a good discussion point for a second. Hospitals, and I don't know why, besides the fact that they get more referrals, I don't know why hospitals spend hundreds of thousand dollars on expensive rehab technology. You're literally there for only seven to 14 days, let's say. No specialized technology is going to enhance your performance that greatly in the rehab setting where it's going to allow you to have, be at a new level when you're discharged after two weeks. It's, it takes a lot longer than two weeks to sustain those outcomes. And I don't understand why hospitals don't start with the transition discharge process on day one of hey, whatever you work on with Skip, let's have a really good continuity of care where when he's discharged, he can replicate these things in a home environment. Because for instance, if you were going to be using, and I don't know if you've, if Kaiser has uh, robotics, for example, but if you're going to be using a fancy high-tech shiny robot that costs $100,000 to move your hand or your arm, my first question is, well, what does the research say that, what will your outcomes be after two weeks? Because literally you'll only be there for two weeks using it. And is it really a good return on investment for those two weeks? And more importantly, now that you are exposed to this robotic device, what's the game plan for when you go home? By the way, you live, let's say, an hour away, knowing you can't go back there. Maybe you can. Does outpatient also have access to it? And if they do, what does the research say about using a robot device only two times per week for 30 minutes because you won't be using it daily? 
because you're only going to get two or three times of outpatient per week. So my point is, should we continue to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on robotic technology or expensive high tech te technology for rehab that does very little to improve the patient within a two week period and also could potentially add to their frustration because, hey, I was using this fun robot and now I can't because I'm in my third floor walk up apartment and I'll never have access to that again. Should we go that route or should we go the route of, hey, all these patients are leaving this month. Let's utilize all that money that we could have spent on a shiny little robot. And let's create these home exercise program bags, of tool, a toolbox, if you will. They're going to take home with all the questions and answers so they can replicate what we did during the therapy session. I know I'm biased because I'm always about affordable evidence-based technologies, but I also, I'm also realistic knowing no one's going home with a robot. I'm also biased only because I didn't have any robotics. My therapy was as old-fashioned as it gets. Yeah. Had, and, and isn't it funny that you did quite well? <laughs> I had walker. I had tables, therapy tables. I was working lots of hands on working my muscles and, and, and whatnot. Manual therapy. Yep. I had a little wooden step that I practiced doing some steps. There was nothing high tech. It was yep. all old fashioned therapy. It reminds uh, me of the, uh, when you, when you buy new appliances right now and God forbid one electric wire breaks, you just wasted a thousand dollars on, let's say a, a, a wash machine. I like to go back to the old school wash machines that are a little bit more reliable. But my, my point is you recovered immensely with old school techniques. And at the end of the day, old school research is the best, is, is the best outcomes, which is, a, you know, high rep task specific functional yeah. training, but go ahead. One thing that's important is that I had a problem with drop foot mm -hmm. okay? and they were they were trying to jury rig different things. When I left there, I would have liked for them to have said, and I, pardon me if this sounds like a commercial, but you need to go to someplace like Sabo and see what the different opportunities are for you to use their merchandise, their their techniques for drop foot. I, I would have had that answer the first day. Right. It took me, what, three, four months to find you? Yep. That part of it has got to be accelerated. Yeah. And that's the, the issue there is it's a challenge to have all the therapists that are focused on neuro rehab be up to date on the latest technologies. It's very hard to get everyone on the same page. And it does require a special clinician to go above and beyond to understand what is in the marketplace that is created on a quarterly basis to expose their patients to that. Obviously, companies like Sabo have to do a good job continuing to educate and promote and properly inform patients and therapists, but that will always be a continued struggle with everyone being on the same page of what's even available, right? For home use. All right. So as we turn the corner from inpatient, we finally get discharged. Do you end up going to an outpatient center? I did. I'm, I'm back at outpatient Kaiser Roseville. When you were discharged and you went to outpatient, what were they working on? More fine motor skills for the hand still, and then maybe lower extremity rehab for the leg with a PT? The first thing they did was they uh, eliminated any future need for uh, speech therapy. Yep. All my cognitives had, had returned and there was there was no issues there. So it was primarily PT, physical therapy. So I was introduced to uh, my outpatient therapist, uh, Michael, who I had a great relationship with. He's been wonderful. And the reason it works so well with Michael is in our first uh, session, we're sitting down almost knee to knee and he leans into me and he says, what is it you want to do? And I said, I want to walk. And he goes, then you got to walk. <laughs> so he gave me the 500 step challenge, which meant that from the parking garage to his office was 500 steps. And I had arrived in a transfer chair. I didn't walk into that first meeting. He said, when you come back in two weeks, I want you to walk with your walker from that garage to here. I'm going, <laughs> are you kidding me? That's more like 500 miles. I can't even stand up. And he says, you got to do it. And so we went to the park and we marked off 500 steps into and out of the park. And for the next two weeks, twice a day, I walked in and I walked out and walked in and I walked out. In two weeks, I very proudly shuffled into his office in my granny walker and it kind of went on from there. Isn't it amazing? We were just talking about products and, and what's available in the marketplace and mentioned robotics. Here's another example. You know, what's fascinating is there's every month there seems to be a new what they call digital therapeutic company that comes out with these wearable sensors that you wrap around your ankle wrap around your your leg wrap around your arm and then you play these games 
and you and it tracks your progress and you can do it at home in a fun and easy way, they say. And you're just sitting there playing games on your couch, moving your moving your ankle, moving your arm. And you do that for 30 minutes because they want you to do repetitions. Now, I'm a big fan of repetitions, but what's interesting is, do you really need to spend a couple hundred dollars a month with a subscription to play games and wrap a sense around your leg? Or can you do what you're supposed to do, a functional task that's meaningful? And what is meaningful? Get up and walk, Skip. Walk, right? And so my question to you is, did you have all the other bells and whistle digital therapeutic devices at home with sensors and games, or did you just walk? No, I just walk. <laughs> up i would swing my legs over from the bed where i just finished all my bed exercises and i would stand up and i would stand up and i would stand up maybe a couple hundred times a day sure it's a purposeful task yeah and what that did is it it, it helped keep my legs in condition uh -huh. but it started sending those messages to my leg it's all repetition well it is for everyone it's all repetition the question maybe. is you need a really good therapist to, to, I guess, filter out the noise because it can be, it could be a struggle for a new stroke survivor. And they see so much online. Like, what do I need? I need, the, there's like a thousand things you can do. And you were blessed to have a, a, a PT that kind of saw through that and filtered out the noise and said, look, you just need to work on your basic, meaningful, purposeful task. In this case, it's walking, practice, sit to stand transfers, get up, move. He gave you a goal. That was perfect. He didn't say, okay, here's a subscription, get these sensors, wear this and, and do, you know, leg exercises while watching video games. So it, there's a time and place, by the way, I, I would think a lot of kids, maybe younger uh, adolescents would love that just to keep them motivated. But at the end of the day, all you're doing is walking. And so it's a repetition at that point. All right. So 17 years later, or excuse me, 17 months later, sorry. How are you now? What's lingering? What's, what's, what, what are you struggling with at this point? So probably. Uh, endurance is my my biggest issue. I can walk now with very little drop step. My spasticity, which showed up six months after my stroke, I'm starting to work that out at the gym. But endurance is is probably the most persistent thing in in my life. And you're so back to work. I'm back to work, but only four hours a day, three days a week, and it will probably never be greater than that. Right. Because at the end of that four hours, because I've been, my mind has been so active and so many different connections have been made, I'm exhausted. Sure. And endurance is always going to be a battle. I, I hear that from a lot of stroke survivors that endurance is tough and it's really tough to get that back. But you got to just keep exercising, you know, manage that, work around it, energy conservation, take more breaks. You're doing it all right there. The Stroke Angel Project. Why did you... I mean, clearly you learned a lot over the 17 months, but even before that, just knowing who you are as a person, you you seem like you're a guy that wants to share, uh, do your part, help others. Stroke Angel Project, what was the impetus behind that? And what are your goals with the project moving forward? As I said earlier, we were very frustrated with finding resources and reference material. As I began to collect those, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if they were all in one place and people could, in my situation, could relate to that? So the theme of the Stroke Angel is let my recovery be your hope. So I just want them to have something that they can see and feel. And I tell the whole story and they can say, yeah, I got a little bit of that. I've got a little bit of that. And so this fellow is pointing me in the direction that I need to go. He's being inspiring uh, along the way. It's just a very, very practical, good resource that's free. It's available to anybody that wants to uh, to log on. And it's dynamic. It's changing all the time. I have a series of interviews with clinicians. I've got an interview coming up on Thursday with a lady that runs a caregiver organization in Northern California. So it's going to be an ongoing uh, resource. Well, I can tell you one thing. You're, you're hitting the nail on the head when it comes to patients and family members, especially family members, needing resources in that first few weeks, A, first few weeks post-stroke. But then the first 90 days, you know, the big, the big unknowns that I would think caregivers want to know about what stage they are in their recovery process. No one really communicates that to patients. Hey, Skip, welcome to inpatient rehab. You're stage two at this point using the Brunstrom stages of impairment and recovery. It's a predictable model by Signe Brunstrom, a Swedish physio back early uh, 20th century. And they have seven stages, one stage one being completely flaccid movement all the way to stage seven, which is normal movement. 
you know, Skip, you're at stage three. You have some spasticity. It's hard to, hard for you to move your leg or arm. My goal in the next, you know, month would try to get you to stage four. Obviously, we want to get you to stage seven. No one does that. No one does that. I think it's important to have therapists understand, explain to their patients what stage there are in the recovery and what to expect in the next 90 days. Really hit the nail on the head. There has to be a continuity of this recovery, and it has to be explained to you. What was explained to me is the first three months. Okay, that's the golden time. You're going to make most of your improvements. What they don't tell you is what can happen after that. At the end of three months, I did almost 6,000 steps in one day. And the next day I fell onto my plateau. I didn't fall on, I crashed onto my plateau. Mm -hmm. And three months after that, the spasticity kicked in. So they don't tell you what can happen. They always talk about your full recovery. And I think that's a great disservice. They never talked about fatigue. My first episode with fatigue was like a giant shroud just falling over me like this and immobilizing me, sucking all the will out of me. Nobody ever talked about that till it happened. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think during that 90 days, there's a massive lack of education. And so not only the stage you're at, not only here's your pitfalls, it's, I always liken it to the AAA t- triptych. Remember the triptych back in the day? Yeah. So if you want to go from Buffalo to Florida, they would, a lady would sit down with you or a guy would sit down with you and get the highlighter out and you would, they would map out your trip. We need to be mapping out your trip as a therapist. And I'm going to tell you where the pit stops are going to be, where you need to, you know, refill your tank, where the uh, roadblock will be and guide you along that path for the 90 days. And then after the 90 days, as a clinician, I need to be telling you, look, you're going to hit a lot of mini plateaus. You're going to have some mini setbacks, no doubt. Just like we have setbacks in life. You're going to pivot. You're going to edit. We're going to find new ways to work through your recovery and you're going to excel through the next run in your recovery ladder. I'm also going to mention to you as a clinician, here is a couple resources for you to uh, start educating yourself on the latest advances in neuro rehabilitation interventions. Don't believe everything you hear or read. So when you want to see if a intervention passed the litmus test, type it into, for instance, PubMed, which is a online um, journal search for understanding the research articles, randomized control trials. You can you can search them up and see what the results were and see if it actually passed muster. So I think the education from a therapist to a patient needs to continue on and say, look, when you get home, here's the five or six or 10 things that I need you to do with your next therapist during a proper handoff, because a lot of times you're not going to be with them and some things to watch out for. And that's part of that trip tech we were talking about, right? Desperately needed. So maybe, you know, like the Stroke Angel Project, maybe that's one way of doing it. So I commend you for, you know, uh, paying it forward and doing this project. And I want to try to work with you uh, from Sabo's perspective, because we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to educate the caregivers and patients and fill the voids that they're not getting from their clinicians. So they not only know what they need to do the first four you know, eight, 12 weeks, but what are you doing six, nine, 12 months, right? And have some of those resources. So the podcast is one way, but we are also thinking of other ways we can still help onboard properly patients and family members early on in the recovery process. So I really appreciate this this call today, Skip. I hope the audience learned a lot and uh, maybe got inspired. So, it, you know, final thoughts, recommendations for patients, families, therapists that you'd like to pass on from your experiences? Yeah. I have one right here on my band. What's that say? Never give up. You can't give up. You can have bad days. I I had bad days. My caregivers had bad days, but you just got to rally and just keep at it. To to win, you have to keep from losing. And only you can do that as the captain of your your recovery team. I like that. To win, you got to keep from losing. Well, thank you so much, Skip. I really appreciate our time today. And we'll have all your information listed in the show notes. Don't be a stranger. Let's re-engage and, and figure out ways where we can help your audience and we can get the word out for you and your, and I know it's a it's an awesome resource that you're providing. We want to be a part of it. Okay. Thank you, Henry. All right. Thanks, Skip. You have a good day. Thank you for tuning in to the No Plateau podcast. Please make sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on more stroke and brain injury recovery stories. The No Plateau podcast is intended to give you an insight into stroke and brain injury survivors' journeys. Any opinions given on this podcast are strictly the individual's, and we do not suggest that you necessarily hold the same viewpoints as anyone on this podcast. This podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is 
is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Reliance on any information provided by the No Plateau podcast is solely at your own risk.